Okay, uh, welcome everybody um, to uh, to another Azure user group online. Um, as uh, as is customary now, we had um, all of the uh, technical teething issues, but managed to get through them really quickly, thankfully. Um, I want to, we're really lucky tonight. Um, we've got um, Uri Barash from the Microsoft product team. Um, I've been working with uh, Yuri and his team on Azure Data Explorer, um, which we're using across the board now. It's a fantastic product. Um, and the more I learned about it, the more I thought that it would be a great idea to uh, to get the um, to get the team and specifically um, Yuri, who's the group program manager, um, to talk about um, all of the incredible developments in Data Explorer and using Custo. Um, so I will let Uri introduce himself and um, and I look forward to his session. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. If not, just let me know. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, uh, to spend the time with you today. Uh, my name is Uri Barash. I'm the uh, I lead the product group for uh, Azure Data Explorer, or as we call it internally, uh, Custo. Um, and uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in Microsoft for quite some time. I was working on um, big data from almost the first day, even before I knew it was big data. Uh, worked on uh, alerts and subscriptions in SharePoint and uh, ser analysis services in security and forefront uh, uh, products uh, analyzing massive amounts of data, security data, then like recommendation in the online stores for Microsoft for the Windows and Windows Phone stores, uh, Microsoft advertising, uh, every, like everything in that route is big data, and then like uh, user understanding in Cortana, listening to what 40 million people are doing like uh, every second of their life and analyzing that, inferring that. And recently, uh, after being a client of uh, Azure Data Explorer from the Cortana side, when there was a time to uh, to switch, I actually joined the uh, Azure Data Explorer team in order to take it to market uh, as it was an internal product uh, till then. So I'm here to tell the story of the product and uh, I hope I can like uh, excite you as much as I am excited about this. And we have about 90 minutes, so it'll give us uh, plenty of time to uh, to understand the product, see uh, cool demos, and uh, have a valuable uh, Q&A sessions uh, at the end. So definitely if something is unclear in the middle, just uh, write in the chat window and I'll try to uh, to address it as we as we go. So uh, welcome and yes, we'll talk about Azure Data Explorer. Uh, it's a big data interactive analytics platform. Let me explain what I mean by that. And when we're talking about organizations and systems, uh, as they're dealing with a stream of information that's flowing in from a variety of sources, we're talking about uh, three different types of processing that we apply to this uh, incoming stream. And we also refer to this as the Lambda architecture. And in the uh, topmost uh, area, we have the hot path. Uh, in the hot path, we uh, react to events as they come in. We uh, usually with standing queries that respond immediately in like uh, near zero latency, uh, triggering events, triggering alerts, uh, and usually relying on in-memory cubes or stream analytics techniques uh, and uh, allow us to respond immediately. Uh, unfortunately, they are uh, pretty constrained in how much memory do they have and how much uh, contextual information they can take into account. On the other side, we have the cold path. In the cold path, we have uh, large streams of data stored on chip storage and we have like a um, large compute that can uh, process them, uh, Hadoop, 
MapReduce, like MapReduce, like Hadoop and 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 other technologies that are unlimited in in uh, in size, that are unlimited in in uh, the the power that they can apply. They can practically run any ad hoc analytics, model training, etc. But they also run for typically for long periods of time. In the middle, we have the warm path, and you can think about this kind of. Uh, a glass window into the pipe of information flowing into the organization and there you can have the kind of the middle ground where you can run ad hoc queries on relatively fresh data uh, sometimes seconds old uh, and uh, here you can run uh, uh, practically the analytics that you want on 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 this uh, you know this period of data between seconds and months and there we find technologies like column stores and indexing, and this is also where we uh, find Azure Data Explorer. The interesting thing about Azure Data Explorer is that uh, when teams started to use Azure Data Explorer, we've seen workloads moving from hot to uh, Azure Data Explorer because uh, people were trading off some of the immediacy of uh, responding to events for taking more context into account, re running more complex algorithms and practically trading immediacy for higher accuracy and reduce false positives. We've seen teams like the Xbox team that move 95% of the cold path processing from the internal Microsoft Hadoop to Azure Data Explorer because the data scientists could be much more productive during the day. Instead of running a bad job and then going and get coffee or tea or whatever, they would actually uh, issue a query, get a result in a few seconds, and then uh, validate or invalidate the theory and move forward. And uh, trading off some of the, the amount of data that they're querying, but moving much, much faster during the day. And <clears throat> when we're talking about like the, the, the change that we've uh, went through, uh, this red data was always there in computer systems since the 70s of the previous century. Uh, and But we've seen like uh, waves of growth where amounts of data that we process as, as organizations and systems uh, are growing both in size, but also in uh, the expectation about like how quickly should we process it? And also in the variety, like is it uh, just uh, numbers or is it like uh, text and uh, semi-structured data? And we're seeing that wave continues to grow. And uh, with the big data wave, we see some very clear phenomena. First, the data changes very, very quickly. Uh, new types of uh, application, new version of applications, new vendors, new uh, expressiveness of apps, uh, more information coming in in different ways of form. We change uh, uh, applications and, and that actually causes a lot of people to encode the data in free text elements or in JSON elements, uh, not so they don't need to change the schema of the data pipelines uh, so often. Another interesting aspect is that a lot of this data is telemetry data, activity data, records of activity. Some people call it log, but we're not talking about like uh, with all the respect that I have for Windows uh, uh, security event log. Uh, this is actually a log of any kind of activity, a market event, a, a, a stock event, like uh, uh, any kind of activity could be high level or low level that is happening. And that information uh, is coming in in very high rates and we no longer know uh, how to aggregate it uh, automatically as it comes. Once we were doing it once because we knew what we were looking for, but now in the velocity of our business environment where new decisions are need to be taken uh, on a daily basis and uh, because of the rate of decisions, we need more people, more knowledge workers that can make decisions based on data in a data driven environment that can make those decisions and they need to uh, make the decision on aggregates of the data that they didn't know uh, they would need when the data came in. So we don't like aggregate the data, we just pour it uh, as is and we uh, aggregate it as needed. 
And this is practically the essence of the digital transformation. This is the ability for every organization to sense all the things that are happening around it, how it interacts with customers, with uh, vendors, with the marketplace, with the weather, with its employees. Uh, everything that might impact how the business operates needs to be taken into account in order to optimize our business. And this is like this is the essence of the digital transformation. We're seeing it all over, practically in all verticals. And um, those actions can really they, they span like uh, things that relate to retail, uh, understanding how people are using my product or service, uh, and those decisions can hap even happen like within the day or in some cases even faster. Uh, and and this is practically why. Uh, we build Azure Data Explorer, which is a fully managed uh, data analytics service that's optimized for streaming data. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about the numbers in a second, but we can handle uh, fairly large amounts of information uh, uh, really, really quickly. And it's designed for data exploration, and I'll, I'll, I'll demo all these things. Uh, and in one sentence, if we're thinking about like what it is under the covers, it's an append-only uh, data platform. So data that comes in gets appended in the end of the stream, in the end of the table, and it's optimized for a high velocity. Uh, uh, and we don't support like deletion or updates of like uh, uh, specific records that were ingested. And the uh, the data that uh, that's coming in is like uh, when we're talking about big data, we're talking about high volume, high velocity, and high variance. And uh, with variance uh, that text and semi-structured and structured all get uh, uh, ingested together. With Velocity, because it's an append-only data platform and we don't need to lock, uh, we can actually scale out horizontally uh, almost uh, uh, without limits. And with a single server in the back end that we deploy that can handle about like 200 megabytes uh, of uh, data per second, uh, it, it can grow very, very large. It exposes a relational model where you have tables, rows, columns, um, what you uh, are like accustomed for from any other data platform. Uh, and it allows you the ability to filter, aggregate, join, create calculated columns, but also run a high performance full text search over this data, run time series analysis, uh, execute Python R, and C sharp user defined function on the data near the data without moving the data practically uh, in a distributed manner. And uh, all that is done in a fully managed way where you don't need to manage servers. You just get one um, uh, rest endpoint that you interact with in order to um, uh, operate the service. Uh, it's fully, um, it's a pass. Platform as a service, uh, uh, service, and it comes uh, vanilla. What do I mean by that? It doesn't come with any specific domain knowledge, even though we operate in the operational area, the financial services area, uh, time series, IoT, whatever. Uh, the service itself is a, a, a pure data platform, and you can like add the specialization for different uh, verticals, and it's optimized. Uh, exactly for this purpose. It was purposely built for this as opposed to other products in the marketplace that were built as catalogs for online stores. This was built to handle the uh, high velocity uh, stream of, uh, of, of large scale uh, events and provide interactive analytics uh, on top of it. And when I'm saying interactive, let me give you a few examples. What do I mean? In this case, this data is operational data. It's coming from a, a set of 100 servers uh, that uh, not by accident are powering the uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Power BI uh, service in the cloud. And we're looking here at two tables. One table is the trace table, which is practically a log. Uh, it's a broad table with a lot of fields. 
uh, and uh, in with a lot of diversity and the uh, air performance counters table which is practically a time series, a metric table, and now we're a table with a lot of records as well. So when we're looking at this database, it has about like 30 terabytes uh, of data that we keep compressed uh, on storage and on disk. Uh, it takes about like three terabytes of data. And let's look at a little bit at what we can do with it. Let's take the trace table, the log table, and pipe it into a count operator. This is the uh, KQL language, uh, Custo query language, and uh, you can see that it takes uh, 15 columns, 41 billion row uh, table, pipes it into account that emits a one row, one column table with the number 41 billion in it. But counting row, counting rows is is easy. Let's do something, uh, some things that are a little bit more complicated. By the way, all the queries that I'm going to run now are being freshly computed as I run them. We, like in this demo, we don't cache the results. We have the ability to also cache the results, but these all these queries are uh, computed from scratch as I run the query. So let's do something more interesting. Let's take those 41 billion rows, slice them for one day, uh, which is only 800 million rows, and then we'll aggregate them by the error level uh, and see how much uh, row, how many rows we have for each error level. Now, this uh, this query uh, runs for uh, 750, in this case, milliseconds. And this is the kind of performance that you can expect from a high performance column store, which is what we have in the back end. And you can see in this case that we have uh, two and a half million uh, uh, red rows here, like uh, error level two is error. So we'll do a short exercise of seeing where those two and a half errors are coming from. By the way, this kind of like uh, aggregation query is a typical dashboard query. So let's say, uh, let's before we, uh, we try to explain the numbers, let's take a look at like how the data looks like in the trace table. So we're taking 10 rows from the uh, from the table and you can see that we have like a uh, date time low cardinality string high cardinality strings and integers doubles uh, decimals uh, all you want including json native uh, fields full text fields that all get indexed automatically into the uh, database as the data comes in without the need to define indexes or tokenizers or any uh, uh, similar things. And uh, also support arrays and uh, as I mentioned, and JSON and arrays. Uh, but one interesting field here, let's take a look at the role field. As, as, as I explained earlier, like the developer for in order to not change the schema, pushed like both the machine type and the machine index into the uh, uh, role field. So we have the gateway role uh, machine index number zero. Uh, it doesn't help us to understand which type of machine is generating all these errors. So what we'll do, we'll take the, um, we'll take the role field and in runtime we'll parse it to the role type new calculated column and throw away everything after the underscore. Then we'll aggregate it by bins of 10 minutes and uh, render a small time chart. Now you can see that this query runs for about like 400 milliseconds, if I'm not mistaken, at 340, yes. And you can see that there is one type of machines. It's called the SharePoint integration role, SPI role. You can see the calculated column here that extracted those results that one type of machines is generating more errors than the others. So we can actually ask the uh, uh, SharePoint integration team to go and fix their stuff and move forward to see where the other errors are coming from. Let's take a different angle. Uh, all you saw un until now is something that uh, high performance column stores can do. Uh, let's take a look at something else. Let's try to find the user that has suffered the most from these errors. Uh, over uh, this time. So what uh, uh, we can see is that uh, we will look for 
uh, login events. This is an indication of login events. And then we'll use regular expression to extract the user ID, the persistent user ID from the data, associate it with the session ID, the client activity ID, and then join it back into the, uh, the trace table, filter it by errors, and aggregate it by the user ID and see who is the top user who experienced the most errors in this day. Now, this is a join uh, of two uh, 20,000 login events joined with the two and a half million errors in a 41 billion row table and it finishes in a second. And you can see that 3309 is the uh, is the poor user that has suffered like the uh, the most errors here and that actually uh, makes us curious about like what is he doing. And we can see that if we query for that user because we look now for his token in the uh, event text, then uh, we can see that uh, that user is experiencing a database does not exist errors, and there is some problem with the network transport, etc. And you can see that it's the same cardinality, and uh, it provides us some good explanation about what's happening. Uh, with 3309. Now, the interesting thing about like systems that are built on on this technology is that you can run dashboards, investigations, and alerts on the same stack, uh, and all of them, when you investigate an alert, you can actually go and 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 you know that the data that supported the, the alert is actually there in the system. And here you can, uh, we are following a session like that, and we can see what happened before, during, and after the session. All these queries do not have any specific indexes. They're just running on the row table. Now, we believe that KQL is a very powerful language, and we're having like hundreds of thousands of people that are already using it and providing us with very good feedback. But we know that uh, during uh, uh, adoption and transition, people really like uh, there are quite a lot of people that are familiar with SQL, and this is why uh, the service supports uh, uh, SQL natively. For example, here we translate automatically a query from SQL to uh, KQL. What's interesting is that uh, when we ran conversion programs, uh, typically, uh, SQL queries shrink to about a third of the size and become dramatically more readable when we move them to uh, uh, to KQL. Another interesting uh, thing is that because uh, because uh, in KQL you start from the you start from the table, and then when you move forward, you can you immediately have IntelliSense that really help you uh, drill in and do things uh, with the. Uh, uh, with the data, even if you were not familiar with it uh, earlier. Now, uh, not only we know how to translate, we actually can run, one second, we actually can run SQL queries. Uh, more than that, we actually support the TDS on the wire protocol, which is the SQL Server query endpoint. That means that you can treat Azure Data Explorer as if it's a read-only SQL Server and connect it to other a system that know how to speak to SQL Server, for example, ODBC, JDBC connectors, and, and a, a large variety of other things. Let's switch gears a little bit and uh, switch to time series. So what's interesting with time series is that there are narrower table and we can do different things with them. For example, in this case, we're looking for the three machines that experience the top CPU. Uh, in this uh, in this in this um, uh, cluster. And um, you you can see in the chart that uh, one machine here has peaked. This uh, machine reached 60% uh, CPU. Uh, it's one of the three top uh, CPU consuming uh, machines here, but it peaked because it rebooted. We investigated it and it rebooted. On the other hand, the other two machines are exhibiting this kind of a CPU leak pattern, uh, which doesn't seem healthy. So what we'll do is we'll use some of the built-in ML functionalities that are uh, embedded in the product. Uh, and in this case, we're looking for jump shapes in CPU, in CPU uh, time series. And we're looking for all the machines that are exhibiting the same uh, jumps 
in their CPU patterns. And what you can see, and we're running on a table of 35 uh, billion rows uh, of measurements with uh, 30,000 different sensors that we are uh, tracking. You can see that uh, there are quite a few machines, some of them even didn't reach high CPU yet, but there are a few machines that are leaking CPU. And you can even see exactly when we deployed the bug that caused that behavior. And, and uh, when we're talking about ML, uh, there are multiple types of machine learning and, and, and AI ops that we're leveraging here. Another one uh, is the auto clustering. In many cases, when we are analyzing something, we want to know what is the reason, what is the, the contributing factor for a phenomena. So what we're doing here, we're using a non-supervised auto clustering technology that um, uh, that uh, takes the phenomena here of uh, errors and tries to see what's common uh, among the lines of the different uh, error indications. And uh, without any knowledge, prior knowledge about uh, the system, uh, you can actually understand what is the typical, like there is some featureization here, but uh, you can see that the SharePoint integration role is responsible for 42% of the errors in this data set. And you can actually run auto cluster on practically almost any uh, 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 phenomena and see what's uh, if there are any common clusters that are uh, creating it. Let's skip for um, uh, to look at uh, some other data. If we're looking here, uh, these are events from the GitHub repositories. These are all, all the activities of the GitHub um, uh, repos in a specific period. We have about like 100, 1 uh, billion point two, uh, 1.2 billion uh, uh, events here. And if we're looking for the period, uh, we can actually see that they span uh, all the way from January 2016 to the beginning of 2019, uh, three years of uh, GitHub uh, activity, but that also does not help us understand how the data behaves. So what we'll do, we'll summarize how many events do we see over time uh, by bins of one day. So we aggregate them by one day and we uh, uh, will draw a short uh, time chart of how the data behaves uh, over time and you can see the holiday seasons. This is the holiday seasons for 2016, 2017, 2018, and you can also see the weeks just by just by looking at uh, the activity. Uh, and if we're looking at the data here, the data here is much more complex. You can see that the uh, ID, event ID, and the type are uh, promoted columns, but uh, the actor field is a complex JSON. The repo field is a complex JSON, the payload as well. But what if we want to know how many unique users have contributed to GitHub uh, in this period? So what we'll do, we'll query directly into the, uh, into the JSON because we can query uh, uh, into the uh, into the JSON, for example. Right, so we know how to. Yeah, mistake. So we know how to query directly into the JSON, and then we can also like run a uh, distinct count over this. So this is practically uh, opening up 1.2 billion JSON files and computing a distinct count on that, and it finishes in less than a second. So that that's what we call interactivity. And uh, by the way, for, so far I did not see any questions, so uh, this is a good time for questions. And uh, before we switch back to the presentation. Uh, Yuri, we've got one question. Uh, does Data Explorer only sit on a append only type of storage or can data be updated like in SQL databases? Awesome question. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Azure Data Explorer is a database 
that's billed as an append only. We do support things like GDPR deletion, but those operations are very expensive, just like um, blob store deleting one record from a blob store of five giga, uh, gigabit uh, is expensive. So uh, the normal operation is to uh, ingest, uh, uh, ingest uh, uh, immutable events and don't not not change them or drop them we can drop shards of data i'll explain about the architecture in a second but uh, updating uh, single cells or single rows is not supported we have ways to deal with that uh, and i'll and i'll go over them but uh, no this is not a, a transactional database uh, we do not support what we call acid like uh, creation deletion update etc we only support append. So uh, switching back into the uh, into the presentation. So uh, uh, while this is a relatively new product, we've been out there uh, in the market like for a year or so. Uh, at Microsoft, this is a very uh, heavily used. Uh, service and practically Azure runs on it. We are ingesting at this point over like the, this slide gets uh, stale almost every week. So we are currently ingesting like almost 27 petabytes of data per day. We are running on nearly a million cores uh, on Azure. Uh, and the interesting number here is the 35,000. These are distinct uh, Azure Data Explorer users that are actually writing queries and not only it's in the number of users internally within Microsoft. So that means that a quarter of the workforce at Microsoft is actually writing queries and this is the essence of the digital transformation at Microsoft. Over the last six years, uh, six and a half years, where this service has been uh, in production at Microsoft, where this service has been in production in Microsoft, we got like a quarter of the people at Microsoft writing queries against databases themselves, not relying on dashboards, on applications, or any other like uh, mediator, but actually answering queries that they need to know the answer for. So writing and running those queries. And this is a, a, a really phenomenal a change in culture because you don't need to wait for the uh, for the IT department to generate a report for you. You can actually go at the data. And, and we've seen that phenomena very, uh, uh, it's a very dramatic phenomena it was at Microsoft. Uh, Yuri, there's a there's a couple more questions. I don't know whether you Go want to it. take these. At Go the for it. Oh, that's fine. Great. Um, so somebody asks, um, how does this compare to offerings such as HD Insight? Wonderful. So uh, this is actually something that I would love to cover like a little bit later after I go at the uh, at the architecture because then we can talk about like the different aspects. I'll discuss this and how it relates to the entire data platform, Cosmos DB, Databricks, Data Warehouse, and all the other uh, uh, brothers and sisters in, in this happy family. Fantastic. All right, the question questions are coming in thick and fast now. Um, so we've got um, from Lakshmi, you mentioned about user-defined functions in Python. Do you have any examples to show? Uh, I don't have an example right now, but I can follow up with examples. We are like, I can talk about like some of the scenarios here. Um, I have a, an example with R uh, that I think I can show, but uh, it's pretty, pretty much the same. Um, but uh, OK, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question. Um, the query times are pretty amazing. Does the service have to cache any metadata to get that kind of performance? Yes, so this this actually brings me uh, to the architecture. So I'll, I'll have another slide and I'll explain exactly how the service works in the back end and, and it will clarify exactly what, what we're doing and why this is performing like that. By the way, we're working on the next version. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about like the performance improvements that are coming. So just in terms of like, uh, 
couple of words about the journey. Started as like few folks from the Power BI team. This is ex this explains the data set, but also the concept of column store and Vertipack, etc. That uh, wanted to store the telemetry for the Power BI servers in the cloud, and they've created this log repository. It was adopted very quickly by every other product at Microsoft. Uh, so everyone is storing telemetry at Microsoft practically in Azure Data Explorer, even SQL and Cosmos DB and, and Data Warehouse and uh, Azure Storage and Azure Networking, Windows, Office, etc. Like uh, we replaced um, a large set of products internally at Microsoft. We replaced Splunk at Office at Windows, generating about like 70% of cost reduction only on hardware, not talking about licensing. Uh, uh, Sumo Logic, uh, New Relic, etc. Like there was a lot of uh, replacement currently. This is one of the um, basic services in Azure. When we set up a new Azure Azure uh, region, we exist in all Azure regions naturally. But uh, just after, immediately after compute and storage are running, then Azure Data Explorer gets installed, so all the other services can actually um, uh, troubleshoot and, and monitor what they're doing. In uh, 2017, we replaced all the underlying uh, analytical uh, backends for Azure Monitor, Log Analytics, Application Insights, all the security products, including Windows and Microsoft Defender, Advanced Threat Protection, the Azure Security Center, Sentinel is running on Log Analytics and on ADX as well, but also Gaming Analytics in PlayFab is based on that. Uh, all the IoT stack, IoT Central, the uh, Microsoft Connected Vehicles platform and Time Series Insights are all using ADX as a underlying platform, and we see more products coming in, including Product Insights uh, that is uh, providing uh, uh, analytics over uh, uh, products and uh, Teams uh, Education for class and, and school district that also provide uh, teacher and, and district uh, insights on uh, on uh, on uh, learning uh, activities, uh, and uh, we launched on February 9th. So we are about like uh, we're celebrating one year and four months now. Uh, uh, very soon in the in the upcoming build, and and um, yeah, that's a it's a actually a phenomenal story. I as I said, I was. A client of this, I was not part of the immediate team that uh, that um, that initiated it, but it was definitely a, a fun experience to take it to market. So, how the service works? Data can come in from a variety of sources, uh, either from uh, data that lands in the data lake or in Blob Store. Uh, that we know how to listen to data landing there and ingest it, or via Event Hub or via IoT Hub. Uh, we have uh, a Kafka sync that uh, can connect us to Kafka streams. Uh, if you have a, an ELK deployment that you want to um, enhance, then you can route data directly from Logstash into uh, ADX. We also support all the client libraries for the major languages from and naturally .NET, C Sharp to Java and Node and Go and uh, uh, Python and uh, what have you. Uh, integration with Azure Data Factory for moving data in, in um, yeah, on a scheduled basis and also a Spark connector that allows you to uh, route the output of a Spark job into uh, Azure Data Explorer. When the data comes in, uh, there are two variants of the data, but let's talk about the mainstream. Batching is actually uh, data that comes in, in in pieces of 100 megabytes, uh, half a gigabyte. We have a customers, uh, we have a customer that's sending uh, almost like 50 terabytes of data per day. Uh, each byte is about like one gigabyte of uh, of data. Uh, that uh, arrives and is every second. So you it's not really a batch scenario, but uh, it comes in uh, batches so that when the data comes in, we can index it, we can uh, sort the order, order it as a column store, we can compress it and store it as a data shard, both on the local SSD of the machine that is ingesting the data, and also in blob storage, what shows up as ingested data for persistency, even if the service, if, the, if, if this specific machine goes offline or the service is paused. 
Uh, in some cases, some applications, for example, if you are looking at like log analytics as a uh, as a user of us, they have also very small users that are sending data to very small tables. Uh, and uh, in, in this case where we call it like trickling data, you can't build column store shards automatically as, uh, and still maintain lo low latency for ingestion. So we created a row store that you can stream data into it uh, in uh, one record by one by one records, and then you can uh, reach latencies of a sub second between an event happening and it showing and the event showing up in queries. When the row store fills up, it gets flushed as a, a data shard into the uh, into the rest of the with the rest of the column stores, and, uh, and the row store is is emptied. Now, queries come in from the other direction. They get uh, they can come in via the REST API. They can again all the client libraries, but also ODBC, JDBC. Uh, that are coming from the support for TDS. We have native Power BI connectors uh, that support direct query, um, the web UI that you've seen, but also integration with Flow, Logic Apps, Azure Data Factory for orchestration, uh, and support for Jupyter Notebooks, uh, a variety of open source uh, platform, including Grafana and Readers.io, which are excellent dashboard for metrics and, and others. And also the Spark connector that allows you to run jobs in Spark on data that's managed in Azure Data Explorer, pushing down predicates so only the relevant information gets fetched from Azure Data Explorer into the Spark job, uh, saving a lot of processing uh, at that time. Now, the uh, another functionality that is um, interesting uh, in here is the ability of the engine not only to work on the data that's ingested in its proprietary and highly optimized format, but also the ability to query data in the uh, data lake in its native format. Uh, we call that external tables, and we can actually go at a nicely partitioned a repository of Parquet, CSV, JSON, etc., and query that. It's not as fast, but it's definitely useful uh, when you have like massive amounts of data that you don't necessarily want to ingest, but still want to uh, pick at from time to time and join with other uh, 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 data. In addition, we can also query into SQL servers, uh, and and other uh, uh, HTTP data sources. Uh, another interesting aspect that's here is that we also support export of data to the data lake. So uh, not only one-time export, but only also continuous export. So if you have, for example, data coming in from an IoT hub or event hub, and you want to organize it in in the data lake in this uh, nice uh, partitioning scheme of like day, month, uh, like year, day, month, uh, day, etc. Then we know how to uh, package those uh, incoming events as parquet and emit them to the, the data lake and uh, generating also a data lake copy that's available for uh, the rest of the tools that you might want to run uh, over the data. Uh, <clears throat> in the same path, because we support Python and R, we can also run uh, machine learning. Uh, we can also run enrichment of the data as it comes in, apply business logic, but also run ML uh, scoring, enriching the data, classifying it uh, immediately as the data comes in. And then when we generate the data lake using continuous export, it already contains the enriched and, um, and classified information. So, one scenario that's uh, touching on that point is that if you uh, want to train uh, a very large model on a large amount of data, you can use the Spark connector to run your Spark job on the data uh, in ADX. When you finish the model, you can upload it using the Spark connector back into uh, Azure Data Explorer, and then uh, the incoming data will be um, scored and, and classified based on this model. And we have quite a few customers that are doing it, uh, making sure that like uh, training happens only when it's needed in the uh, in the rhythm that it's needed. So to summarize here, uh, Azure Data Explorer combines the ability to do metrics and time series, uh, 
text search and analytics, multi-dimensional relational analytics that brings them all together in a simple uh, like query language that makes it uh, easy for humans and machines to uh, work with it. Uh, and also the support for SQL makes it all more accessible for the ecosystems of SQL speaking tools. Uh, and with a user defined function in Python R, uh, it complements the set of like uh, power that we need to deliver. Uh, in terms of uh, the other two uh, interesting elements here, uh, we know how to query across uh, locations, across uh, geographic locations. So if you have like uh, 30 different uh, clusters with the same schema in different Azure regions, then you can actually query an union across those table, analyzing them and providing one report across the geo pushing down the uh, everything that can be pushed down to the different clusters. And we have deployment like that, like the Renault Nissan connected vehicles scenario, etc. The last thing is, uh, is, uh, is the ability to ingest data very quickly. I refer to it. Um, and uh, I, the next thing is, is pricing, like pricing a very high end data platform is very dangerous because if you are making a mistake, either you are losing money, which is not sustainable in high scale, or um, you are too expensive and you cannot compete. And this is I'll I'll, I'll share in a second like exactly the um, the uh, the pricing model that we're using. <clears throat> so this um, this page is available from our. Um, from our pricing page, it helps um, it helps estimate the cost of uh, future deployments. And let me show you how it works. Uh, if, for example, you have a system that emits uh, one terabyte of data per day, and you need to store that uh, information for 14 days on hot SSD storage, and for three uh, and for a full year. In uh, uh, in blob for in terms of retention, then you can see that this kind of of a system would cost you about. Now let's go England. That type of system would cost you about like uh, uh, three grand. I think that the UK, US, we might have a different. No, this is like, this is. So it will cost you about five grand, and if you apply a uh, three year RI, it will cost you about like three that for a very massive uh, data platform. Now, how do we price? It's cost plus. You can see the machines that are doing the query answering and the ingestion. This is just like a pass through of the cost of the compute. Um, this is a pass through of the machines that are uh, orchestrating the data flows, and this is the premium storage that uh, store the SSD. Uh, and um, this is a little bit, little bit of a, a transaction, a storage transaction and network, and the service cost that's uh, associated as well. So um, practically, uh, because we also are passing through the cost of the infrastructure, you can actually leverage RI uh, of uh, compute or storage that you are using anyway. Yeah, back to the uh, back to the uh, architecture diagram. This is another very good point for questions. Okay. Do we uh, do we have any questions for Yuri at this stage? Yeah. The one thing I didn't. Yeah. I'll continue. The one thing that I did not mention is that. Like when data comes in and gets stored as a data shard on the local SSD and the ingested data, then it gets evacuated from the SSD based on policy on the specific table. And it's yet ev ev uh, evicted from the ingested data based on the retention policy on the same table. So you can set those two values. And based on these values, uh, based on specifically on the SSD capacity, this is what causing like uh, was driving the amount of machines that are needed in order to keep the hot data available for fast query um, uh, uh, when when needed. Uh, so referring to the uh, query speed question, 
how we achieve this? We achieve it by putting the data in high performance SSD near the CPU and distributing the query across the machines, the different machines that host the data, and using a highly optimized uh, internal uh, format that's uh, continuously being improved in order to provide this kind and, and better performance. And this is definitely something that we constantly work on. Oh yeah, I touched on the RI uh, compute and, and storage and the RI for Azure Data Explorer. It actually generates like pretty nice uh, discount. And let's talk a little bit about patterns. So we're seeing like multiple things that are happening. First, we see uh, people, engineers, data scientists and product managers be able to get uh, ad hoc insights. Uh, into what's going on. We see people building products, and I'll give a few examples soon. Um, building product features uh, on uh, ADX as a backend, as a backend uh, data platform. And uh, definitely the near real time monitoring experiencing spans those two things. And uh, investigation, uh, root cause analysis, etc., is very uh, common as well. Uh, one of the recurring questions is like, uh, okay, so. What's the difference between this and log analytics, Azure Monitor, etc.? So the answer is uh, we have multiple vertical solutions, solutions as a service, SaaS, that are built on top of Azure Data Explorer. And the answer is like, when do I use this or that? Like, if you can use something that's up the stack that provides you more value that you find like useful for you, definitely go up the stack. If Azure Monitor addresses your needs for data center operational monitoring, then definitely use that. Uh, the same for the, like for security, it's even clearer because like security brings in like unique security value, uh, time series, etc. Comes with UI, comes with like full integration of like getting the data in, and uh, the map of services. Uh, Xbox PlayFab delivers a very wide set of uh, services around like gaming, etc. So if you can use the solution as a service, it will allow you to focus more on your core business. But if for some reason you decide to build a solution and customize it, then Azure Data Explorer is a very good platform to choose for this type of workloads. And uh, uh, we are seeing, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Uri, there's a there's a couple more questions. Um, if you, it. right, so um, somebody's asking about the internals. Of, um, of ADX um, and whether there's any information available on that? Uh, definitely. Uh, Azure Data Explorer is built from scratch on top of Azure Compute and Azure Storage. It's a complete fresh stack um, that is optimized exactly for this purpose. Uh, it does not rely on any specific, uh, other than our regular expression library, I think. Uh, the entire engine is built um, from scratch. Okay, um, we've got we've got another question um, about the developer tier. Somebody's asking, um, will the developer tier be available in the UK? The developer tier is available in the UK, if I'm not mistaken. I think that the challenge is uh, with COVID-19, we've had like I don't know if you felt, but we've had some capacity. Um, yeah. Very much so in North Europe, we felt. Yeah, North Europe was exactly one of the ones that one of the data centers that experienced it more. So, did I did I lose you? Uh, no, uh, no, 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 no. Okay. So, yeah. okay. So, so, it should, uh, so it yeah. should be available. So the development it should be available. Should. Yes, it should be available. If it's not, then. Uh, I'll check it out. Like uh, which which data center? Like yeah, the UK South, UK West, or let me check. Um, one let's see whether we get an update to the question. Uh, UK South. Um, the question is about you see, UK South. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so uh, here in UK South, you see that you only can 
generate like L family right now because the D families is out of stock. Right, uh, okay. I'll check this out, but this is, the, you know, uh, our uh, when issue. we designed the SKU, yeah, when we designed the SKU, we didn't think we needed a dev test SKU on, uh, on each type of like machine family. So that's the uh, that's the reason. I'll check out what's the status on UK South. You can feel free to email me later with the with the details, and I'll see what I can do. We can definitely can uh, find ways to enable. Okay, great. I'll um I'll circulate um Uri's details um to everybody along with the talk in um in a in a message at the end. Um, we've got one more. Um, when the data is stored, is it made geo redundant? Um, what's the services SLA? Wonderful. So the service SLA is three three nines availability. We're working to make it four nines. Uh, we are actually at ninety nine point nine eight uh, effectively. So it'll take us like a, a few more cycles to get to uh, to a, a comfortable zone when we can say four nines without uh, without uh, losing sleep. Uh, the uh, the deployment is local. Uh, and it stores the data in the local um, in the local uh, 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 blob storage. We do support availability zones, and with availability zones, it supports like three different buildings in the same region. So that's uh, it's called ZRS deployment. And for example, here in the in the pricing, you can actually choose to enable. Uh, availability zones. It has like a, a few bucks to uh, a few pounds to the to the to the bill, but that means that machines and storage is spread across uh, three different buildings. The uh, the approach we we just published a document about how you do BCDR, uh, but if you need to store data in multiple regions, you should ingest data into the different like you should have clusters in both, and ingest data into both. Uh, each, if you are doing it for locality of the data, that's completely fine. If you are doing it for BCDR, then you just double ingest to both. And uh, we found that when people are like creating their own accurate BCDR, it ends up much more efficient than if we build like a, a geo redundant uh, service. And because this data. And because this service is about like scanning broad sets of information rather than like uh, for, as opposed to like for example Cosmos DB that stores documents and those documents can be synced efficiently across um, across uh, across geos uh, for us uh, the data is uh, is mixed and mangled and the queries are mixed and mangled by by nature and that means that in order to provide consistency, it takes a, a, a very large effort and will impact dramatically the cost of the service. And this is why we don't want to, uh, we did not support it yet. Uh, so we have strategies to how to provide uh, geo redundancy, and we definitely have very good guidance on how to uh, operate in a in a, a distributed manner. For example, like I told you about the Renault Nissan that have, uh, I believe like 35, 36 clusters in different in different data centers because each one is handling the local telemetry, but they are querying across all of them uh, together. Um, yeah. More questions before we move on? Uh, I think that's it for the moment. We're good to go. Awesome. So we see two types of customers. One is uh, large enterprises or enterprises that are creating a data platform for telemetry uh, and they're managing it for themselves. And uh, I'll go over the customers. I'll, I'll try to show you which one is which. And we have uh, that are doing it in order to like practically digitally transform. The other type of customers is um, ISVs that are building analytical SaaS applications for the same purpose, for helping large organizations digitally transform, but they're building it by providing them solutions uh, for the digital transformation in their specific verticals. And this is the pattern that we've seen at Microsoft. This is also the pattern that we're seeing uh, externally. And yes, it's like in terms of vertical, it spends uh, 
almost every uh, uh, vertical that we are familiar with, all the way from dairies to gas and oil and, uh, you know, manufacturing and uh, diapers and uh, trucks, like what have you. So uh, in terms of uh, competition, these are the, the typical typical scenarios that we've uh, that we've done. We've uh, we've replaced quite a lot of uh, uh, Elasticsearch deployments in where Elasticsearch is used for log analytics. Uh, we're not, we don't support like boosting or ranking or natural language. So for natural language uh, uh, kind of like uh, searches, uh, we definitely like Elastic is a very good solution. We even use it as Azure Search is using Elasticsearch in the back end in order to provide uh, cognitive search. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, a lot of uh, scenarios where we compete with uh, Google BigQuery. Uh, the technologies, the underlying technologies, are there have a lot of uh, similarities, I would say. And uh, I can talk more about this uh, if uh, if it's of uh, interest. Uh, BigQuery provides two pricing model. One is per paper query, which five five bucks per gig scan, uh, per terabyte scan, and the um, and uh, and the slots mechanism. The slots mechanism is exactly like how we uh, also price uh, Azure Data Explorer by dedicated servers in the back end. And that's also what's uh, providing uh, BigQuery the ability to provide some uh, reliability of the um, uh, of the query latency. So it's practically, uh, it's a very close offering. Uh, we don't compete in with BigQuery on data warehouse workloads where you have uh, large curated uh, fact to fact to fact to fact joins. This is exactly where our data warehouse is actually competing very well uh, against, uh, against uh, BigQuery. Another uh, very common scenario is time series repositories like InfluxDB and CrateDB and things like that. Uh, we tend to uh, consistently um, succeed in these uh, compete engagements. Um, so that's, um, uh, and also like, uh, we've done quite a few Splunk replacements where people are using Splunk as a data platform for telemetry. Uh, it's uh, Azure Data Explorer is dramatically more efficient and powerful. So talking a little bit about customers, uh, we're seeing, as I said, like there is the telemetry analytics platform and we have companies like ESRI and Tabula and uh, DocuSign and Grab uh, I talked about Greb and Bosch in the last Ignite, so there is a video session that's uh, demonstrating those. And and the DocuSign uh, uh, CTO, uh, Mr. Eric Fleischmann, talked about like how uh, ADX uh, transformed DocuSign, uh, which was uh, digitally native even before uh, Azure Data Explorer. Uh, and these all are like just pouring all the telemetry into Azure Data Explorer and making their employees enabled, empowered uh, with data. Uh, in the analytical SaaS domain, you can see like Bureau is creating, uh, in this scenario, they're creating chocolate and pasta machine. They uh, they say that 80% of the world's chocolate and pasta is generating using their machines. Apparently, when you generate chocolate, you measure a lot of stuff. They, for each machine, there's about like a thousand sensors that are measuring everything every second, few times every second. So they generate quite a lot of data. Uh, and they provide dashboards, real-time dashboard on uh, those machines to their customers. Uh, financial Fabric is doing this for financial, the financial industry. Ecolab is doing it for swimming pools and vegetable washing machines, industrial vegetable washing machines. Uh, uh, Zoom D is interesting because we met these folks when they were kind of like uh, trying to scale up uh, in their deployment, they were using a, a data warehousing pattern with ETL and loading the data into a data warehouse and then uh, loading it into analysis service, etc. And uh, they they couldn't really scale. We uh, in 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 five weeks we connected. What they're doing, by the way, 
they are a, a mobile advertising company. So they have um, elements embedded in mobile apps that are sending event data telemetry uh, from the uh, from the apps, uh, impressions, ads, everything that like uh, an ad platform does. And that information uh, we routed uh, directly to Azure Data Explorer and provided dashboards to their customers directly over this data. So taking a very complex pipeline that had the latency of the ETL and was not uh, scaling uh, too well, and we replaced it with a direct flow of data that allowed them to scale like 10 times uh, in, uh, in less than three months afterwards. Uh, EpiServer is using it to classify uh, is embedded because it's part of their API and part of their uh, platform in order to uh, allow customers to create segments of users and, and personalize uh, retail applications. And Siemens Centineers is uh, doing the same like IoT uh, that Bueller and Ecolab is doing for um, medical imaging machines and uh, quite a few more scenarios. Um, BASF is another interesting story and, uh, and they're using like heavily using the uh, Python capability, the ability to score data as it comes in. Uh, uh, the folks from BASF uh, told us an interesting story about like how rain, uh, they're using Azure Data Explorer to optimize chemical processes across different plants that are geographically connected. Apparently when it's raining, the temperature uh, the heat loss in the pipes that connect the, the factories are uh, is different and they need to know like take into account the rain no rain when they predict how to tune the chemical processes across the plant just just uh, an anecdote on how weather uh, impacts uh, impacts uh, 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 digitally transforming a company it also works for pizza and delivery um, yeah, so these are quotes from uh, Siemens engineers in Tabula. We replaced, by the way, both uh, uh, Elasticsearch and uh, BigQuery workload. In about three weeks, we were in production on 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 that CDN analytics, and since then we've done more uh, more progress there. So, talking about like a little bit about positioning. Um, when we're talking about like cloud scale analytics, Azure Data Analytics, we're talking about like three types of workloads, three patterns. There is the modern data warehousing pattern where you take uh, data, you run it through an ETL, you aggregate it into a very well curated business model that provides a well defined, curated, strict semantics. A, a business model like a data model, data mart that you upload into a, a data warehouse and you serve it. And that's extremely valuable for everything that needs to be consistent, reliable and well understood in a consistent way across uh, across the company. Uh, and, and nothing can replace that. It's very good for the classic data warehouse workloads and TPCH is the best benchmark in that in that domain and modern and our Azure Data SQL uh, data warehouse or in its new name Synapse is doing a fabulous job there. Uh, the real time analytics is a different pattern that we've launched uh, and uh, um, and Azure Data Explorer actually operates. Uh, there are other things that are doing machine learning, but Azure Data uh, uh, Explorer actually operates in this area with real time analytics and machine learning. And this is the well-known uh, uh, modern data warehouse uh, pattern, as, as I explained. And this is the real-time analytics pattern that we uh, launched uh, last year uh, in this form where you can take a lot of data sources uh, that are streaming in real time, either run them through like uh, real, real, real-time analytics with uh, Azure uh, Stream Analytics, or you can route them uh, into Azure Data Explorer and you can uh, also route between them. And that provides you the ability uh, to look at data both very fresh and provide schema on read on the data. Uh, and, and we've seen like Grab and Bosch demonstrating this in Ignite. When we're looking at the uh, uh, enterprise uh, uh, logging framework, then 
this is something that we see very, very common. We have the underlying services, for example, uh, HD Insights and Databricks and Data Explorer. And we have like solutions that come uh, well defined, like Azure Monitor and Time Series Insights and others. Uh, that and they all can work together. For example, uh, today we can query data across Azure Monitor and Azure Data Explorer uh, and, and join data. So actually providing a single data state for real time uh, analytics. And uh, in for data style, for data uh, streams that uh, do not fit in in the other solution, you can actually create your own custom solution uh, with Power BI, with a custom UI, etc., uh, and and manage it uh, the way you need to. Uh, when we're talking about like the difference between uh, Azure Data Explorer and uh, and uh, for example HD Insights, HD Insights uh, is a set of open source technology that is grouped together. Uh, it has a Kafka, it has Spark, it has uh, Hadoop, like quite a few things. Uh, and for interactive analytics, the ability to run queries, as I showed you, uh, HD Insight does not provide any uh, equivalent solution in terms of perf uh, and scale. On the other hand, uh, they are uh, well integrated using the Kafka sync and using the uh, uh, Spark connector. So when you want to run Spark job in HD Insight, or for that matter in Databricks, uh, uh, you can definitely uh, uh, you can definitely do it and run the uh, interactive analytics with uh, Data Explorer, uh, dashboarding real time, and use the uh, Spark, which is a which is a great platform for for bad jobs. Uh, in Spark. Uh, in terms of like I, I touched lightly on Cosmos DB. Cosmos DB is a beautiful uh, uh, document store. Uh, and uh, when you are trying to do like large scale analytics and do uh, cross, an cross key analytics in large scale, then this is not what it was built for. It was built for the ability to read and write data very, very quickly, an operational store for apps and, and services, etc. Uh, when you're trying to run analytics over uh, across the uh, large amount of keys, then Azure Data Explorer provides dramatically uh, better performance and, and, and also cost performance. And there are there like Additional questions about uh, about the positioning because we can definitely talk more about this. Um, I uh, I have a question, Ari. Um, as um, as someone um, who's uh, who's part of a team who's re recently started ADX, um, what what quick start uh, materials can you recommend to people? Um, who who um, who need to school up quickly on KQL and um, and understand what the nature of enterprise deployments are um, for ADX? That's a that's a great question. So the first thing is that we have a we have a KQL uh, from scratch course. Uh, it takes about like uh, uh, two or three hours, uh, it gets you all the basic stuff that you need. And you have the uh, the sample databases in our help cluster that it points to, and you can run queries and and play with stuff, uh, and and really get up to speed uh, incredibly quickly. And that's uh, that's on the uh, on the language. In terms of um, setting up a a a, a service, then uh, we are definitely working on an end to end. Uh, course uh, again in plural site, and I'll share the link for the for the plural site uh, 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 KQL from scratch. Uh, we're working on courses for end-to-end uh, -end management of the service, but in general, this is a a pretty straightforward uh, uh, process. You go, you create a, a, a dev cluster, and as I showed in the portal, you create a database, and today. You can actually ingest data and even automate ingestion of data from uh, event hubs. <coughs> or from a uh, data lake. Uh, automatically from the UI and, and get uh, get started really quickly. One of the. Um, 
Uh, one advice is even if you are trying to, um, uh, to if you want to run the product in a VNet, uh, start with the public deployment first, like get things running and only then like uh, fight the gods of the network when you are uh, in order to get it into production, but uh, dealing with data and exploring data, it's uh, it's uh, it provides you a good start this way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we 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 obviously um, we obviously spoke about the VNet deployment, and um, the um, I think one of the things that I'll say is even though there um there are a few steps when you when you're when you've got all of the enterprise security controls in place. Um, everything is very well documented on the um, on the ADX um, uh, documentation around user defined routes and um, how to set up network network hackles and things. So we didn't really have have an issue. I thought it was qu quite fluid. It was just um, it was just all the small things that you forget in the process. I think. First, thank you. And uh, there is one update that I can share is that. And because it was an internal product, then our documentation was internal in, in essence. And it was like almost uh, like the rest of the Azure documentation in terms of like the system and the approachability, etc. But recently we've actually publicized and, and merged all the, the, the documentation. So it's practically sits on docs.microsoft.com. And at this point, we are very, uh, we welcome uh, uh, happily uh, any feedback and any contribution or advice over the doc. If something is unclear, etc., definitely let us know and we are fixing it uh, as quickly as we can. We think that docs is, first it's a part of the doc, it's, it's a essential part of the product and uh, it's a, you know, like, Lacking docs is like a, it's a poison. So we definitely invest heavily in 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 making it right and collaborating with the community. Both internally at Microsoft, we have a huge community, and also externally, that's like growing very quickly. Fantastic. Um, we've got we've got another question, which is. Um, are there any samples you can recommend in the solution architecture gallery or GitHub for using Data Explorer in a data in a data warehousing scenario? So we let me tell you this. Uh, you know, we have people using Data Explorer in the data warehousing scenario, uh, but we tend not to publish solutions like that because like data were for data warehousing uh, we definitely recommend uh, synapse or azure sql data warehouse and uh, we know it's typically the right uh, uh, the right approach for data for classic data warehousing uh, for other scenarios we uh, we do have solutions we do have like customer stories we have uh, i think about three we are publishing more but uh, what i can say is that if you are trying things out uh, because we're a new service and because we are very excited about this, uh, reach out to me. I'll get you uh, uh, hooked up with someone who can help uh, either someone who is experienced from the community in the UK or someone from the product team will will help you get through it. We have support uh, channels both in like uh, uh, Stack Overflow and the community and we respond extremely quickly. So uh, definitely reach out to us and and uh, we'll help you like both design and get through uh, any friction that you run into. One thing that I'm that uh, uh, we have like six minutes more, so I'll Try to cover a few more things. So data sharing. Data sharing is really cool because uh, what we are doing here practically is we are leveraging our separation between the storage and the compute in order to generate like more compute nodes, uh, another cluster on the same storage uh, for a different purpose. For example, if you have a operational uh, analytic system that powers your dashboards and investigation root cause, but also you want to have like data scientists banging against the same data and you don't want them to impact the uh, performance of the uh, the main uh, cluster, 
you can actually create an ad hoc data science cluster that looks at exactly the same data uh, with different like uh, caching policies uh, that uh, uh, data science can can uh, uh, can both use and also pay for in terms of like if they have a different like cost center and subscription. And the cool thing with Azure Data Share is that you can actually do this across companies. So if as a solution you create a multi-tenant solution with a database for each customer, you can actually share that customer database with them, allowing them to instantiate their own compute on the same data that you collect and manage for them. Uh, and they can then use it to join it with their own data and run their stuff without impacting your production uh, workflow. So that's a really cool integration. We are seeing a lot of good feedback about that. Um, other things, uh, geospatial support was introduced this year, so uh, I'll show you a few uh, cool things there. Um, Yeah, so you can see a few things and uh, distance between points and like uh, polygons and the uh, 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 spheres and, and all these calculations uh, that takes into account the roundness of the Earth are actually uh, supported. So this is um, this is also uh, uh, very useful uh, these days. I'll show you another example in a second. And uh, yeah, I'll share this. Like there is the the resources here for all the the things that I've shown, um, and you can like uh, uh, would love you to reach out to us and 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 to uh, be with you during the journey. Okay, Uri, fantastic. We've got um, another good question here. Um, for anything written in the UI, can it be committed to Git? How does this work in a CI/CD pipeline? Wonderful question. So we have a DevOps task that can uh, deploy uh, things from a repository. Uh, here there is a set of tools uh, that uh, can do it. Um, so yeah, the DevOps task is the answer for this uh, uh, typically. Uh, check it out. If, it, if it's missing in any way, then um, uh, let's talk about it. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you. We've got three minutes left. So um, if anybody wants to, if anyone wants to ask any questions, um, I just want to end on saying um, thanks, Yuri, for a great talk. Um, I think there were there are a lot of features in there that, that I didn't didn't have sight of, like the um, SQL translation into KQL and uh, TDS endpoints, which I think uh, a fantastic and it's great to great to see how mature um, ADX is um, really things that will resonate with um, uh, with with businesses. Um, I just want to tell um, our audience that um, uh, Uri and the ADX team are incredibly approachable. Um, please please get back to them if you've got um, any issues or um, you want to trial things or you need help with deployments. Um, and um, you know we've had uh, fantastic response times and a, a great deal of help from them um, to get us on track. So um, you know really, I want to thank I want to thank Uri for the talk, but um, also um, everyone, please take him up on that offer if you have uh, any issues um, to 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 get you on the right track. Definitely. And by the way, we have like a, a set of sneak peeks and focus groups coming up in the uh, next week at build and uh, we'll show a few like uh, cool new things so uh, that I am not allowed to share because it's like public and because it's recorded like you know I'll I'll save it to build uh, at this point so if you're interested then uh, definitely join us there. Fantastic. Thank you very much for uh, speaking for us, um, Uri, and I'll uh, send your details and I'll send the link around um, and then any any slides or anything that you want to send to me uh, in between, um, I'll send on our outgoing email tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard and Andy, for connecting and making this possible. 
it was a pleasure. Highly appreciated. Fantastic. Good night, everybody. Thanks.